From Software's new game is open world. There will be significant RPG elements. It's allegedly their largest project to date. And it's called Elden Ring. Elden Ring's development started just as development for Dark Souls 3's DLC ended. As of today, that's more than two years of development, and while we don't have a release date for this multi-platform title, I would put my money on early 2020. Uh, this is considering that From Software often launches new titles in March, and also that Sekiro is likely to get DLC later this year. And unlike Sekiro, Miyazaki states that Elden Ring puts more focus on RPG elements, which I know is going to please all of us. That means, he says, a wide variety of weapons, magic, and ways to engage enemies with the strategies that suit you. More variety, says Miyazaki, even when compared to the Dark Souls series. And you want to know why that's incredible? Because that kind of diversity meshes really well with the fact that this game is open world. For the first time, Miyazaki does say that there are many definitions to the term open world, but that From Software has simply tried their hand at creating a game with a large open field to play in. A world that, yes, still contains intricately designed levels, such as multi-layered castles and such, he says. And I can only assume that this means we'll be able to tackle those areas in whatever order we like. Which, again, could be incredible because whenever I play Dark Souls, I try to sequence break as fast as possible. I always try to deck out my character with unique gear from all over the game, not just the gear that's at the start of the game. And from an RPG point of view, linear progression has always held back souls to an extent when you think about it. However, it really does sound like Elden Ring will afford the player the opportunity to travel to any corner of the world from the get-go. And get this, Miyazaki says this is without a doubt our biggest title yet in terms of sheer volume. And he says that the scale of the world and the narrative to accompany it matches that. And he goes on to say, maybe as expected, the game will still include intense boss fights, character creation, and perhaps most importantly, a focus on overcoming challenges. It sounds like they haven't given in to the people crying for an easy mode just yet, which is good news. After all, the game is about the will or the ambition of mankind, says Miyazaki. And this aligns with a press release that I received, which stated that an adventure awaits the brave and the gallant. All this wording really aligns with the heroic visuals that you see in the trailer. There's this nobility of the self in this trailer, and that's in stark contrast to a lot of Dark Souls visuals, for example, which often emphasizes the worthlessness of the self instead of the nobility of the self. And Miyazaki said that they wanted to create a title that's full of the things that they weren't able to do in the Dark Souls series, and that includes breaking out into a whole new mythos, a body of mythology that is written by George R. R. Martin. And you can tell Miyazaki is this huge fan of the guy. Uh, he writes that George provided incredible stimulus for the team, that George wrote characters, drama, and mystical elements that would go on to shape Elden Ring's presentation. So to me, this sounds like George laid the foundations and Miyazaki and his team built upon those foundations. And so we arrive finally at the trailer let me point out some of the curious aspects of it. Five arms spring from the darkness. Arms that have these knobbly protrusions and an extra elbow, almost as if they're sort of curved outwards from this character's own back. They support this crowned man, or woman, it's hard to say, uh, as he or she raises a twitching, larger hand, sheathed onto their own arm. This is likely Sekiro's lost arm, just kidding. This seems like a sort of dark ritual, one that sets a pretty horrific tone for the game going forward. I doubt you could even imagine it. That which commanded the stars, giving life its fullest brilliance. The Elden Ring, says Miyazaki, 
is the name given to a mysterious concept that defines the world itself. So it's this cosmic, unimaginable force, and what we see in the trailer is it's shattering, presumably at the hands of this blacksmith. And I'm willing to bet that he's a sort of blacksmith deity, which is a concept that exists not only in Norse mythology, not only in Celtic mythology, but even in Dark Souls as well. And this shattering could also go on to explain the game's logo, four rings of fire which are out of sync with one another. Speaking of which, the word Elden may not simply mean old or ancient or elder, but it could be echoing the old Norse term Elder, meaning fire. This could explain the burning sky that we see in the scene to follow. The Elden Ring. In this scene, the crimson-haired woman reattaches a sort of brass arm, which is either locked on with magnetic force or magic, because there is not much there to attach to. And it's a parallel to the character in the first scene who is grafting on an arm of flesh, which may be a significant parallel in the end. Uh, on the other hand of the woman, though, it doesn't look that good. She's sporting blackened flesh and a sheen of rust that is glinting in the sunlight. Uh, also note the parallel between the rust on her arm and the cracking of the blacksmiths. It's almost as if they're all made of some sort of stone, uh, and I assume they're a sort of divine entity. Immediately after this, uh, this warrior thrusts his spear into the belly of his foe and the Elden Ring shatters right after this. Shattered by someone or something. Along with the dialogue about it being shattered by someone or something, I take this to sort of mean that the blacksmith probably isn't the only reason the ring is being undone. And with every blow that the blacksmith strikes, his own flesh cracks. So too does the flesh of this ashen-haired woman, who appears to also be holding the hilt of another blacksmith hammer in this scene. The two aren't just connected with each other, they're also synced with the ring, and they're all shattering together. The rest of the cast are connected as well. As we fly along with this spear, as if we're attached to it with a GoPro, take note of the fallen corpses in the background. They're the same fallen corpses which are present in this scene with the kneeling, tusk-helmed knight. It's very likely that this was who Spear Guy thrust his spear into, and you even see something that could be the Tusk Knight's sword in the background. This guy, as well, has crimson hair, and I assume this signifies a sort of shared faction between these two characters. Don't tell me you don't see it. Look up at the sky. It burns. Obviously, the shattering of this ring has implications for the entire cycle of the world, and I can only assume that our playable, created character will appear after this crucial moment. This is so shattering that a new world order likely has to be defined, and since the theme of the game is the ambition of man, maybe the gods have become vulnerable, and it's our time to shine, or something like that. Sounds pretty familiar for From Software. With one final strike, the blacksmith breaks the ring, bringing it raining down atop the two cracked beings, and a cracked logo appears as well. So all of this pretty much aligns with the first set of leaks that we received, where we discussed the game by its internal working title, Great Rune. It was open world. It involves visiting kingdoms, and it does seem to be inspired by Norse mythology. In retrospect, that video is more worth checking out than I anticipated it being. And on the note of Norse mythology, we should devote some time to the likely cultural inspirations that are present in Elden Ring as well. But you should bear in mind that unlike some titles like God of War, for example, From Software rarely takes concepts in their entirety. Instead, they're more inspired by these cultures, and it often feels like they build ideas outwards from them. So for example, in this trailer and in the leaks, it's likely that they're building off of Norse and Celtic mythologies. 
While I was streaming the announcement live on Twitch, a bunch of people drew parallels to, and I'm gonna butcher the name, but Nuata, a god with an arm of silver that was forged for him by one of three gods of craftsmanship, and also Luke, a man with a spear that always hits its mark. They are all of the Tua de Danan, the tribe of the gods. These noble beings are in opposition to the Fomorions, uh, supernatural beings that represent darker powers. And already it's possible we see this same sort of contrast in the trailer. I'd also like to draw your attention to this character, who has a helmet sporting two angelic wings. This is a popular visual for the Valkyrie of Norse mythology. Valkyrie were warrior women who descended upon the battlefield and judged the fallen. And if you were deemed to have died bravely in battle, then the Valkyrie would take you to Valhalla, a hall where you would dine and eventually fight alongside Odin himself. There's more, like the Celtic knot imagery, uh, Norse hammers, uh, but for now, it's probably best to take these likely inspirations with a grain of salt. The only thing we don't know at this point is about the gameplay. Sekiro, in my opinion, set a new standard for combat systems in these games, and if anything, I desperately hope that they took on some of these combat innovations during development. It's kind of hard to go back to Souls now. Anyway, subscribe and ring the bell so you can be the first to learn about the gameplay whenever it crops up, and I'll see you next time.